Yes, um, so I was given the secondary duty uh, on the squadron of being the Nuclear, Biological and Chemical Warfare Defence Officer, the NBCDU, uh, which was a not the most exciting task in the respect that uh, at the end of every exercise there was always the NBCD phase uh, and so you, then you pitched up and um, made the boys put on their gas masks or the respirators as we like to call them uh, and uh, we operated for a day or so uh, in NBC conditions which is a bit more challenging to, to work in all your kit that you had to wear. Uh, and I did a course at Porton Down, uh, the chemical establishment uh, for two weeks with all these army fellows. Uh, and uh, that was uh, quite eye-opening. So I came back to the squadron and we, so at the end of every exercise, that was my, my role uh, and to make sure the squadron could operate in a chemical or nuclear conditions effectively. So then you got sent to the booth before it actually started. Could you tell us about this? Yes, uh, I uh, got married and 21st of July, I must get that right, uh, 1990, <laughs> uh, and we were on honeymoon in um, Thailand. And we came back from this lovely island uh, to Bangkok and put on the TV for the first time in a couple of weeks. And I saw on the news tanks rolling into Kuwait, into Kuwait City. And I thought, this doesn't look good. We literally got back from uh, a few days later back home. And the dance machine at home was full of messages saying, Red, where are you? Red, are you get into the squadron. We're going on another holiday. And literally we had a week or so to get all our kit. Uh, and we embarked on RFA Fort Grange and headed out to the Gulf. Uh, and as the squadron uh, NBC officer, I had to get all this kit organised, extra bits and bobs uh, to be sent. A lot of it was sent down to Gibraltar and we picked it up there because we had to leave so quickly. Uh, so this was a flight of 846 squadron. And we sailed out down to Jib through the Suez Canal uh, and around uh, the Yemen and into the Straits of Hormuz. And our role uh, was HDS, helicopter delivery system effectively, and we supported uh, the frigates uh, who were operating at the top of the Gulf up near Kuwait uh, and uh, we were flying up and down long-range sorties uh, to them as well as doing some low-level flying over the desert to get used to that just in case things got more interesting. Um, so I was out there from end of uh, beginning of September until uh, December, uh, beginning of December and then we were relieved by B flight of 846 squadron uh, and we were flying around uh, in this lovely weather, hot, but very hot, and, and operating with your, gap, with your uh, AR-5, as it was called, which is your uh, f pilot's uh, gas mask, effectively, uh, was uh, quite challenging, and, and you could only fly for so long when it was 30 odd degrees uh, in a helicopter without any air conditioning. Uh, it, was, it was quite a challenge, I must say. But we were on the, when we, on the way out, uh, we were fitted with these sand filters onto the Mark IV Seeking. The ones you see now, uh, have these boxes on front of the engines and these sand filters effectively when you get, got into the hover uh, in the desert then these helped to uh, get rid of most of the sand uh, from going into the, the turbines of the engine uh, and when we had these fitted uh, we weren't briefed uh, at the time or maybe I didn't read it but we, we believe we weren't briefed that when you were in heavy rain to make sure you switched on the sand filters but we were just flying over the sea so we didn't have them switched on uh, to actually protect the engines from sand and effectively sucked out the sand before it went into the or any sand before it went to the engines. We sat over the hover of this ship uh, in this heavy rain shower uh, and then we transitioned forward uh, and suddenly there was this bang and one of the engines failed and unbeknown to me is because water had built up in this box at the front and had gone down one of the engines, fortunately not both, but went down one of the engines and effectively put the fire out. Um, and so we were down to one engine. Uh, but the seeking was fine, we were, weren't too heavy, and we just carried on to a place called Ras al-Kama, which is north of Dubai, uh, and uh, did a running landing and landed there. And then the, the team, the engineers came out and uh, fired it up, and it was all fine. So basically, you just threw in a bucket of water down, <laughs> down the engine. <laughs> but we got a night stop in a hotel, so uh, we just made the best of it. Yeah. But again, the seeking uh, on one engine was, was fine. We trained for it, but uh, you, it certainly caught your attention when you had hear a bang in a helicopter. Uh, but every helicopter pilot is trained that if you hear a bang or anything, the first thing you do is slightly lower the collective just in case uh, you, you lost both engines because you've got to get the, uh, the pitch off the blades quickly to allow you to keep your uh, head speed so you can then auto-rotate. So that was the first thing that instinctively happened. You'd lower the collective just a wee bit uh, to, and check in to see what, what actually did happen.
but managed to get away with that, which is quite nice. So was I seeking the right aircraft for these first initial two weeks to do the job that you were intended to do? In, in, the, in the first part of the Gulf? Yeah. Yes, because of the long range. We could, uh, you could fill up a seeking and, and you could fly for six hours if you want to. But it was always a trade-off with how much kit you were carrying. So you had to work out your, um, how far you're going to the weight of the, 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 the kit you were, you were taking uh, to actually do uh, whether you could lift it off the deck. Uh, you could do a running la takeoff, uh, as we did do on the way down to out to the Gulf. We had to pick up a, this large generator uh, from, uh, I think it was from Cyprus. Uh, it was a big, big, rather heavy generator, and we were told this, its weight, um, which is actually wrong. We subsequently found out, and we filled up enough fuel to head out towards the ship. Um, and we lifted in. We tried to lift in the hover, but we couldn't get into the hover without over talking it. So we thought, well, we'll just tax out to the runway. And so we did a running takeoff uh, and managed to get airborne and headed out towards the ship. Uh, but meanwhile, the ship was sailing away from us uh, down towards Port Said. And it, we, when you leave a ship uh, on a helicopter and go off somewhere else, the ship tells you its speed and its track. And so you can then plot where it will be at a, a certain time. And so when you go away from the ship and do whatever you're doing, come back, you, it'll intercept where the ship is. And so we headed towards where we thought the ship was, and it wasn't there. In the middle of the Mediterranean, we think, ah, okay. So we looked at the fuel, we thought, well, we can keep going for a while. We called up on guard and on 1215, which is the other emergency frequency, and the ship's frequency, and, and no one answered. And eventually we were getting to this stage where we need to divert um, back to Cyprus, or, uh, and then the ship, the ship would then lose the ship, because it was sailing at full speed to get out to the Gulf. Um, so we thought, well, we'll try this plan B, which was use our HF. And we used to use Porter's Head Radio, which is an HF bunch down to Bristol. And uh, you could do phone patches. You could call them up on HF, and they would, you could tell them who to phone. And you could then speak to people um, on the HF. And it was a, an, another way of doing it, but it wasn't, wasn't secure. But we thought we, we concluded that the only way we were going to find the ship was to do this. So we phoned up on HF, Porter's Head Radio in Bristol from the Mediterranean, and we said, can you phone the Admiralty? We need to know where Fort Grange is in the next less than half an hour, otherwise we will need to go back uh, and they'll never get this generator thing. And they did, they gave us the ship's position and we then headed off towards it and we found it. Well, so, well done, <laughs> Porter's Head Radio. <laughs> So then you went back, but then mm -hmm. you were called up to rejoin the war, as it were. Could you tell us about this? Yes, we uh, went back in early December, uh, and they reformed a new squadron, 848 Squadron, uh, with various pilots from the training squadrons uh, and, uh, and other pilots from within the Navy. Uh, and we were another jungly squadron, effectively. And we flew out in early, about the 2nd or 3rd of January, uh, 1991, and the, the aircraft had already been sent out. Uh, by ship uh, and we met the aircraft in Jabail port where we, we then uh, created this new squadron 848 and so it was a it was a good squadron because a lot of chaps I knew from 846 who'd gone off to other squadrons who were drafted back in um, and uh, very experienced uh, training uh, chaps as well uh, and all the sea kings were all painted up in uh, pink desert colors so and then we had two brand new ones uh, and I picked one up um, from the port. And it was like getting in, when you, if ever you're lucky enough to buy a new car, it had that new car smell. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it was oh. clean and there was no dust or shrapnel anywhere. And you jumped into this thing and thought, lovely. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't get that one to, to use, but we did have our own aircraft effectively for the duration of the, of the Gulf War. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were uh, initially at Jabail Port for a bit. Uh, and then when the air war started on January the 17th, uh, we then uh, headed into, into the desert, about 300 miles or so, uh, up towards the uh, Saudi um, and Iraq border, uh, near uh, King Khalid Military City. And so we were near there with 845 Squadron uh, and the Puma Squadron boys were out there too. Um, and uh, our role was to support the 1st UK Armoured Division, uh, and uh, so moving men and kit around for them. And we also had a second role of casualty evacuation, uh, and we had an RAF medic corporal uh, with us. Uh, and our chap uh, was known as Maggot, but that's, I won't take, go into that detail again, but uh, he loved a chap, and wherever we flew, there was now four of us in, in the Seeking. Um, and uh, we had our, all our gas mask kit, uh, respirator, 
uh, and our weapons, personal weapons, uh, which is SA-80 and the 9mm uh, handgun. Uh, and we also had a, um, a 66 rocket launcher, a grenade launcher, which was a marvellous thing. It was basically the thing you unfolded and then you fired off this grenade and then ran away bravely. Well, that was our plan anyway. Each person had No, no, we had one on the... <laughs> that'd be quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had one on the, one on the seeking. Um, and uh, so we were in the desert uh, as, as, a, as a unit and the, the junglies, as I said earlier, we were trained to do this. We were used to operating independently. Um, and uh, when we landed, uh, we had to dig our, uh, our trenches so that we could protect ourselves for any uh, incoming missiles or whatever. Um, and that took a few days because it was almost solid rock. Uh, and um, we were in a tent of uh, either eight or ten of us. So the four, um, myself and uh, Roger Ramjet, my co-pilot, uh, and uh, crewman and uh, our, um, our maggot, our, our medical fellow, and some of the engineers. So we all lived together. Uh, and our, again, we just flew around the desert uh, supporting the, the, uh, the army um, and picking up any injured people as required. Uh, and again, we, we met using the MVG uh, and our low-level flying uh, to, to good use. We managed to work out that flying around at 50 feet uh, with the radar altimeter hold in, which is normally used for flying over the sea with the radar altimeter hold. Uh, we could fly, get down to 100 feet and then wind it down to 50 feet and so you could whiz around in, in kind of formation uh, with your night vision goggles on over the desert because it was so flat mm -hmm. where we were, uh, it was fine. Occasionally you would you'd set your bug, your warning bug to 10% below your height that you're clear to fly low level. So you set it to about 40 feet or 35 or whatever. And occasionally you get the kind of beep if you're, it had gone, you'd gone too low, even though it was holding the height, you were going over a, a sand dune or something. Um, but in the desert, there wasn't much ambient light for the, the night vision goggles, so it was, uh, it, they, they worked quite hard. Um, but if you're in formation, then you just watch what the other chap was doing in front of you. So how many sea things were sent out and how many crews? Ooh, um, well, there was two squadrons. There was eight for five and eight for six. Uh, and I'm be guessing now, I think we probably had about eight or so aircraft each, if not more. Um, and uh, each helicopter had uh, two pilots uh, and a crewman. Um, and then there were some spare who were working in the ops side in the, in the, uh, the box bodies, we call it, um, organizing the, the tasking. Uh, so there, and the squadron executives, so the boss and the senior pilot. So there was um, yeah, a good number of us and we all uh, said we were effectively in the desert for intense for uh, almost two and a half months. Um, but you were kind of used to it because that, that's how we operated. So the training did work because that's how we operated in the field. And so to do it for real um, was, uh, we, we, we were kind of comfortable with it, even though the environment was a bit antisocial. Uh, you, you, we, it was kind of slightly natural to us in a way. So we're, we were used to that sort of antisocial <laughs> way to live. <laughs> how do their sea kings actually cope in this environment? Very well. Um, we, we had the sand filters. Uh, which as long as you weren't flying in rain and switched them on, they were fine. Um, and they would, they would clear the sand away from the, the jet en the engines. Uh, and so you could sit in the hover quite comfortably and not damage uh, the, the, the gnome engines. Uh, and, uh, but, and, and for low level, uh, as I said, using the radar altimeter hold um, worked very well for us. Um, and the, the amount of people that we could f carry and, and fly around uh, for the tasking, uh, it, it, was, it was good. Um, and we had... Uh, more than enough um, people out there to, 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 to do, the, do the job um, and we were never short and we, 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 yeah, we flew a lot but it was, it was just tasking as, as required uh, until the actual ground war started then we just went into Iraq um, and it, it was such a short uh, ground war fortunately that by the time we were going into Iraq we were picking up injured Iraqis or British soldiers um, and lots of POWs and taking them back to uh, the POW camps which had been set up in Saudi. So do the Sea King's range diminish in this, this new environment? Uh, no, not really. We still had the range. Uh, we just had a wee bit more kit on board, but it doesn't really reduce the, how far we could go. Uh, we, we rarely did long six hour trips. Um, that was really from kind of ship to ship sort of thing. But once in, in the desert, you're doing short hops uh, and uh, you, you didn't use that side of the helicopter uh, as much. But it was just used as a purely as a trooping uh, and a Kazivac helicopter. We, we set up the back so um, we could have some stretchers. We had a stretcher fit, uh, um, a, which was part of, of, the, of the seeking fit, which you could put in, which we had. So we could put some, uh, I think I picked up three 
uh, injured Iraqi soldiers uh, and they were on stretch and they took them back to a hospital. Um, but uh, so we had that fit as well. So it, it, was, it was fairly a dynamic um, bit of kit really that you could do all sorts of things with it. Um, and so it's quite flexible. Is there any incidents or stories that stick out into your mind? From the Does Gulf? Yeah. Um, well, from a flying point of view, uh, I, we had this um, fun of uh, going off low level, 50 feet as I said, um, and you would set your height warner to, if you went too low. Um, and we transitioned off uh, in a formation and I'd forgotten to set my warning system. And we were turning low level uh, and I think we must have been about 50 odd feet or so and I, for whatever reason, I looked in to my left uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, to my right rather and I was just distracted by something and I glanced down at the rad alt and there it was going through 30 feet at quite a rate mm -hmm. and I just gave it a, shove, a pull of the collective and up she went um, and so fortunately she had, it had enough power to, to protect me from that one but that was just classic human error which we all do. Yeah. Um, we also had uh, a couple of uh, Scud missile um, explosions going on above our heads. We, had, uh, we were quite near King Khalid military city, so there was a target nearby, and quite a lot of Scuds would be firing over our heads down to um, other parts of Saudi, and so you get an air raid warning, and so you put on your gas mask and jump into your slit trench, which you'd dug, um, and you'd, you'd watch these things going over, or see the, the, con the trails. But then one day, it was late, late in the evening, um, and I was wandering back to the tent, and I, there was this sudden explosion, um, and I looked up, glanced to my right, I ducked, and it was like a massive firework had gone off, uh, and immediately put on my gas mask and ran into the tent, and everyone came scuttling out and jumped into their foxholes. Uh, and if, what had actually happened was there were some Scud missiles coming in, and our Patriot battery missile, uh, the Americans, were not too far away. And they'd fired off two uh, Patriot missiles, and one, or three rather, and one had gone low level and come straight towards our camp, uh, and they self-detonated uh, just above our camp. Um, it didn't damage any of our aircraft, but there's a few holes in some of the tents. It damaged, we believe, I think some of the Pumas were hit, uh, but uh, no one was injured. Uh, but that certainly, it was uh, quite a firework display to watch, because we then sat there watching more of these, <laughs> more of these going up. And luckily, and, and you could see them going up and, and, and it would kind of explosion as they took out the scud. So they were accurate most of the time. <laughs> so how long did you spend over in the Gulf? And do you feel like this, yourself and the Sea King did a good job? Uh, I was so I was there really from August and uh, in the when it initially went out, we were for the wee gap in Christmas uh, until end of March. Uh, so yes, uh, yes, we did. It, the the Sea King performed very well. Uh, not only were we eight for eight in the desert and eight for five, but eight for six squadron. They were on. Uh, they were embarked on a ship. I think it was HMS Ocean. Uh, may, may be wrong on that one. But they were embarked on a ship. For, uh, for, for a similar sort of role, but uh, to do assaults from the sea if need be. Uh, so there was, there was actually three jungly squadrons uh, out in the desert or in the, in the desert environment. Uh, so yes, the Seeking, Seeking did well. We, there were no technical issues um, that, that stopped us operating. Uh, just the usual challenge of working in, in a sandy and dusty environment for the engineers. Um, and it wasn't always sunny and warm. Uh, in January, it, it was getting down to zero and below uh, in, the, in the tents and we had frost in the mornings and the poor engineers were out there in all conditions and we had sandstorms coming in. Uh, so it, it was hard for, for, for them and uh, easy for us as we just stooged about in the, in the aircraft. But we were out cleaning the aircraft with them um, and hoovering up as much of the sanding and, uh, and helping where we could. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the engineers certainly had a, had a hard time of it, I must say.